we, we talk about snakes and ladders. Now, what was the provocation to write a book uh, on India now? Well, one obvious uh, uh, reason was that we are now half a century old as a modern country. And I wanted to write a post-colonial book because I thought that there's a certain amount of, you know, there are a lot of very serious books on very serious subjects on India. But I wanted to write a post-colonial overview. And my definition of post-colonial is you say, this is what we are, false and all. And any faults that exist in India today, we can no longer make any excuses about historical reasons. They are of our own making. So I wanted to give a picture of modern India with its faults to remind Indians what we can do ourselves, but also what our great successes have been. Hence, snakes and ladders, where we have fallen down and where we have achieved. No, I haven't read the book, but uh, is there a note of optimism about it? Or do you oh, think absolutely. To me, the greatest optimism, two great reasons for optimism in India. One, that we remain a democracy. And, you know, people say we're the greatest democracy in India. But do you realize that when India goes to the polls, it's as if every country, uh, every voter in Canada, North America, added to every voter in Mexico, added to every voter in Western Europe, added to every voter in Eastern Europe, with all their different languages, all their historical hatreds, all their different levels of development, votes for a common government. It is a staggering act of human optimism. The other thing that I have reason to be optimistic about is that we still remain a civilization. I believe we are not a nation in the 19th European sense of the world. I believe we are a great civilization. And in my book, I quote the poet W. H. Auden as defining civilization by saying, the degree to which diversity is retained, unity attained. And it seems to me that for 50 years in India, against all the odds, we have remained this immense uh, uh, act of democracy, and we have remained a civilization. So those are two reasons to be optimistic. I also, in my book, wanted to point out that both the idea of pluralism in India and the idea of democracy in India are not alien impulse. I quote Dr. Ambedkar's last speech to the parliament before the Indian constitution becomes law, where he proves that democracy, as it is practiced in modern democracies, existed in India in the Buddha's time. He says that we had voting by ballot, censure motions, whips, res judicata, everything that you have in a mod counting of that. And he says the proof is that the Buddha used it, taking it from the political assemblies at the time, for the Buddhist Sangha. And those same rules govern the Buddhist Sanghas today. It's an unbroken line of democracy for three and a half thousand years. As for pluralism, India has always been great when it accepted that pluralism. For instance, the Emperor Ashoka, who governed as great a nation as the British Empire did, he never said you had to be a Buddhist to live in India. That pluralism is profound to the Indian uh, 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 mentality. It shows as recently as Raja Ranjit Singh endlessly bringing in philosophers to discuss different religions and having a secular state in the Punjab in the 19th century. We have seen this over and over again. It is not alien to us. Now, uh, what about, uh, we seem to be at a cultural crossroads. Now we have MTV coming in, we have the rock uh, groups coming in. And a lot of things are happening now. Star TV itself is, is a kind of a cultural, uh, what do you call, interference. Do you think it's going to change the... Um, it already has. I write about this in my book also.